All right. Hello. Thanks for joining us, gentlemen. We've got a pleasure tonight uh, joined by Rich and then Mike Pantile is coming on as well soon. So they're happy to answer any questions you've got about developing discipline, whether in the gym or in your business life or relationships, etc. So, Rich, how are you doing? Nice to see you. Let me add you in onto the screen here. How's the audio, Rich? Can we hear you? I'm doing I'm doing good. All right, excellent. You're in. You're so good. tell me a bit about your story then. So the gym's been a big part of your life in terms of developing discipline. How did that all start? Uh a little a little bit of a uh, fat shaming. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought shame is supposed to be terrible, isn't it? The worst thing that can happen to a man. We can't shame people. No. no the best the best thing that can happen sometimes to at the when it's all it's all delivered at the right time. Anyway, no, it was um there was a little I had a I had a buddy and uh I was about twenty and he he took a look at me and he said, Hey, uh you should probably get to the gym and I wasn't like overweight, bad, but I was, you know, 185 pounds soft which is not good if you're a five foot eight, like things aren't, things aren't going well. Uh, have that kind of, you know, onset at, at 20, 21 years old. So um, he kind of took it upon himself to sign me up at the gym. We started working out and then he left me on my own and I just kept going. So that's been a big, big formation because I've been in the gym for 24 years now and just doing it between you know, marriage, kids, everything, all of it, changing what? jobs, moving the whole, the whole gamut. You ever felt like quitting? Cause some guys will start the gym, like for a new year's resolution or something. And then maybe some of those easy gains go away and they feel like, oh, I'll just go back to watching telly. I mean, I don't feel like quitting. I it's, it gets, you have to grind. I think that's part of it is it becomes it becomes grindy that you know how it is there's not every week you want to go not every day you want to be there like you don't you don't hunger for it every single time you go but you do the discipline anyway because you know if you don't go the results are not going to be good you know miss one day miss two days miss three days and then it starts to it starts to snowball just like a good good habit snowballs in the right way this one snowballs in the wrong way downhill and it, it leaves you in a bad spot so no i just i pretty much just was a grinder Tell me a bit about how what you've learned in the gym there has applied to business or your marriage, because one of the common complaints I hear about all areas of guys' lives, not just the gym, but work, marriage, study, is you have a bad day and then you don't show up. And then the next time you have a bad day, it becomes easier not to show up again. And then you get a string of bad days in a row and then that extends into a week, maybe a month. And then you can end up kind of back at square one. And if you look at some of what the saints say about the spiritual life regarding discipline and prayer, this phenomenon happens there too. Yeah, so as, as far as discipline in the gym and then discipline in prayer, um, I've, I've just pushed through all the days that I don't want to do it which I mean, it's, it's been a long time. So I just, even if it, even if it seems like it's going through the motions, like you're still quote unquote, going to the, mo going through the motions. And I think also too, you know, going through the motions of prayer, going through the motions in the gym, and the, there's nothing wrong with that um, because you're still getting the job done. Like the thing, you get the spiritual, um, discipline and the feedback and then you know weightlifting on the discipline and the feedback as well and then i think as far as guys getting back into it is maybe maybe they need to be hard on themselves or they need they need a friend to be hard on them or somebody to, to tell them the the truth and give them a little bit of the push that they need because i think men men don't respond to um niceness as much as they respond to being pushed and being challenged and being told to go do something that kind of that is better for men than um it's okay if you miss a couple of days it's okay if you miss a week buddy it's okay if you miss two weeks come out with me have a hamburger have a drink yeah mike how you doing bro 
Not too bad. How you doing, Will? How you doing, Rich? We're doing well. We're just talking about how doing Rich got well. started in the gym by being shamed by one of his friends, saying, look, you're, you're soft, you're out of shape, you need to get in here and work. And he was saying that most guys respond better to this than being molly coddled and told that things are okay when they're not. What are your thoughts on this, Mike? What was your journey in the gym and developing discipline? Where did it start? So that's funny because I share a very similar story. I was, uh, most of my life was, was spent uh, an obese Italian boy. So in Italian culture, we, we bond over food and uh, my, my family was definitely uh, gluttonous in that sense. So let me tell you something real, real quick and to the point, uh, fat shaming works. It really works. So that, that's what kind of got my start. I was in the trades my whole life. And then I was competing in powerlifting in 2013, 2014. And uh, I ballooned up to, I'm only 5'11", so I'm not that tall. I ballooned up to 306 pounds. And I was a very mediocre heavyweight powerlifter. And, and so over the, the course of, uh, it took me 14 months. And this was supplement and drug-free. I've been a lifetime drug-free lifter. I've been lifting for about 11 years. I lost about 120 pounds. So that was... You know, well, you remember our, my uh, the talk at, at this conference, the, the foundation of my life, I believe the tool that God used the most to, to, to teach me about myself and about him, really it was a tool for him, I believe as well, was the gym. I had no discipline before. And so it's been, oh gosh, nine years since I've lost the weight. And so to, to Rich's point, um, shaming definitely helps a man. I think uh, needless coddling, uh, lends itself to complacency in a massive way. Especially, I think, man, we're, we're forged under that, in that fire, that brotherly correction, you know? So it definitely helped with me, uh, for me in that regard. Yeah, Rich was saying as well that what he'd learned in the gym about showing up on days, even when you don't feel like it, was important as well for marriage and business life too. So the lessons you've learned in the gym and... You are super strong guy, 800 pound deadlift, big lifts all around. You had the mindset to push yourself up to over 300 pounds body weight, which takes some doing. Like most guys wouldn't bother eating that much to get to that point. That's work. You are like bull headed. And when you put your mind to something, you can do it, even though it involves some pain. So I guess you learn a little bit about when to dial back a bit in the gym too, because that's quite an extreme journey to go super heavyweight powerlifter and risk your health at that point in doing it. That's a lot of weight for a 5'11 guy to be carrying around, a lot on your heart, etc. So it sounds to me like you got similar lessons to what Rich discovered, but there's like an, an edge to you there as well that you have to learn to be careful with or it can cut you. Uh, definitely. And, you know, hankering back to my the talk on Saturday, uh, uh, restraint is required past a certain point as well, right? Anything can be taken too far. I've now learned that the hard way with, with injuries. You know, praise God, I haven't had any catastrophic injuries. And I think a, a piece of that is knowing when to pull back, right? I, I've been, I'm very bullheaded in the gym to the point where in the past it's become idolatrous, where like I ha have to hit a PR, or I guess in the UK you guys call it PBs. I have to, I have to, I have to. And that in and of itself becomes uh, self-serving and really – can be catastrophic and self-destructive. So the only way I've been able to build and maintain and continue to build past 11 years, because, well, you know, you're, you're a very strong guy as well. Past about a decade of training, you know, a, a guy gets pretty close to his natural potential. So in order to kind of keep eking out those gains, I think it's still possible. Restraint is a, a necessary piece to that in a, in a big, you can't just come in and just be bullheaded and, balls to the wall all the time and that applies to many things you can't always be bulking you can't always be cutting uh you can't always be abusing stimulants you can't always be doing single repetition maxes uh you have to know it, it takes a lot of i mean it is hard for me even now but objectivity and and looking at it and say hey you know i need to pull back here and there and because th 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 it's funny after i lost the weight i went the opposite direction I was like that, you know, insecure guy that finally saw some abs. It, that became an idol in and of itself. And I was in a chronic calorie restricted period because I wanted to keep that level of bo body fat. And, you know, it's funny because <laughs> in my degenerate past and even with married to my, married to my wife, uh, across the board, women prefer bigger men. It's funny. We, 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 we 
we tend to, you know, uh, utilize, I guess we look at it through the lens of, of what other men seek, seem um, uh, attractive or, or, or I guess appealing. So we want to stay shredded, shredded, bro, for Instagram when really women really don't care about that stuff at all. Like not even close. You know, yeah, it, it, it can come with uh, dietary habits and fussiness about food that women actually find really unattractive. Yeah. Yeah, important then, dialing back, but know when to push. And Rich, what have you found in terms of developing discipline in your spiritual life as well? Finding something that you can stick with consistently and do long term. Otherwise, you can end up saying, oh, look, I'm going to read all the Psalms every day. And then you burn out after a day or two of trying it. So what are some of the things that you've learned the hard way yeah. in your spiritual life? Yeah, I like I like what you had to say, Mike, about restraint, because I think that's that's part of the key too is is knowing that that level of restraint and not going overboard. Where, you know, I, I'm going to read all the Psalms every single day. Like that's that's silly. I mean, it might not be silly if you know maybe you're single and you know unemployed, trying to get yourself together. But if you're married, you have kids. That's a that's a rather silly idea. So, I've I've found that you know. Number one, going through the motions and has its has its spiritual benefits because you get there eventually um, by going through motions and you build up not only discipline but you'll get the spiritual benefits. And when you don't get the spiritual benefits of building up that discipline, that daily prayer, is that's when that's when some of that real growth occurs because during that dry spell, that trying spell, and you keep pushing through. You'll you'll notice that God's God's kind of pushing you in that in that dry state on purpose in your forging of your of your prayer life and your dedication to to the Lord and, and to the church and to your family. You've also um uh, like I like I like what you had to say, Mike, as well about you know restraint making making idolatry out of the gym. I think is a big one for many guys where they're cutting weight and they're doing weird stuff. They're eating weird stuff. And I, you know, same as you, I think a lot of men can fall into idolatry of like getting how big they want to get or cutting weight or their abs, or their six packs. And just, it becomes this like perverted uh, self-worship, you know, worshiping your own self in the mirror. And it's, you know, no, it's gross, but you have to get, sometimes you need to go through that period to be able to look back on it, to say, to other guys like, Hey man, you might be erring towards this, uh, this issue. Like your job is to be strong, you know, for your family, for your wife, to be able to get up early, take care of the kids, you know, do every, you know, take care of your household basically and, and protect your household. Yeah. Great stuff there to unpack, Rich. I think that we do see an idolatry of the body in gym culture and let's talk a bit more about degenerate gym culture in a moment. But one thing your thoughts there made me realize is that for many guys, the pursuit of a number on the bar or a percentage body fat becomes a kind of substitute for the spiritual life, especially with getting bigger and bigger or stronger and stronger, because it's the pursuit of the kind of infinity that we all want. Everyone wants something to quench that thirst that ultimately only God can do. But the prospect of, or maybe if I just make a bit more progress in the gym or I get a little bit leaner, that's going to fill the hole inside. That's going to fix my life. And I've heard guys say, looking back on it, I can't believe that at one point in my life, the gym was the meaning of my life. That was it. The only thing I could think about, the thing that stopped me from being depressed for a bit anyway, the thing I look forward to after work is what I live for. It seems like the thing that so many guys fall into now, but it's a bad place to be in psychologically for many reasons. Mike, what have you noticed about degenerate modern gym culture? You own the gym for a right. Uh, you ran one and you still own one, right? That's correct. And, and it was luck I lucky I, I ran it like a personal training studio. I didn't keep it as like an open membership because I just hate gym culture. Despite I'm looking like a bro, I'm definitely not a bro. Uh, I, I've hated the culture from the beginning, and um, I just think people people dress up for the gym, or I mean, even, even if you want to call it that, you know, even men, you have men showing up to the gym with no clothes on, 
you know, to be seen and flexing and striating and no different than, 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 I mean, this is something I talk a lot about too, is like men that in our combat of, of, of lust and our eyes, the gym is the hardest place to be. We're like inundated with these images all over the place. I find myself at the, at, at the gym, the gym that I contract out of, I have to stare at the floor. It's become, even over just the last 11 years of, of being in the gym and being involved in sort of physical culture, there's less and less and less and less clothing. And it's so self-absorbed to the point where you go to peak hours in any gym, it's like a landmine field of tripods. I'm a fan of filming my lifts, but I film my top set on my water bottle. I don't really care about the angle. I put it away and I finish my workout. You have people posting videos, you know, set to set to set, not really being involved in their lifting. It's more so I really ask myself if social media wasn't around, would people still be doing this? Would men and women actually still be lifting weights for their own betterment? Or are they doing it for the gratification of likes and following and, um, you know, showing off their, their, their asses or their pecs on Instagram. It really, it has become, you know, uh, a culture of animals and not in the good way. <laughs> yeah, definitely strong words there. Rich, any thoughts on this? You train in a public gym, right? <laughs> I do, I do. So lucky, lucky for me, and I've, I've been in the public gym before. I've seen exactly what you're talking about, Mike, with the, with the, the insanity, and it happens even at my kind of local schmuckle gym as well, is, you know, but more at the big box uh, fitness places. I think it happens a lot more of, of people dressing up for the gym. I got lucky when I moved out to the suburbs. Um, I, I joined the Park District Gym and I was laughed at by some of the guys that were out here. They were like, why would you join the Park District Gym? That's, you know, I don't even know. It's, it's not very big. It just has everything you need, you know, bars and weights and a couple hundred pounds and exactly what you need, everything you need. But it's, it's small. The good thing about it is I work out with a whole bunch of retirees and you know a couple high schoolers will come in and some some females once in a while which same thing you have to put on blinders and i've i've done the blinders many times um you know working out at the gym which is you know makes working out harder sometimes when you have to focus on on the blinders and not and not watching and not having them do that weird thing where they're trying to <clears throat> watch you watch them in the mirror because that's the that's <laughs> cultural weird, weird behavior. And um, so I, I, luckily for me, I work out at a park district gym. So there's hardly any members there. Before that, I worked out at a, uh, a hotel gym. You're allowed to join some hotel gyms as a private member of the nicer hotels. So I did that and it's, uh, it's worked out for me to stay out of the big box gyms, mm -hmm. which I couldn't imagine between the music pumping and and the culture there of yoga pants and stuff. I, I can't, I wouldn't be able to, to focus well enough. Yeah. It's two Too things much are involved there. One is if you know that you can't keep the blinders on and it's too much for you, if you're that kind of guy, you shouldn't go, you should find somewhere else to train. The other is whether you're a man mm -hmm. dressing in a way to make yourself an occasion of sin for the women there or a woman dressing in such a way to do that for the man you're doing something wrong as well. So people need to take care of how they dress and also take yourself out of situations that are too much for you to cope with. Just like uh, an ex-alcoholic, for example, if he knows he goes to a party and he's off a drink and he's not going to be able to resist, it's best for him just not to go. So people need to know their own strengths and weaknesses. But if you can keep the blinders on, that would be great. Now we've got a question, which is, can becoming exceedingly talented at a sport like soccer ever be a replacement for time in the gym i feel like this may be a way to make getting into shape fun so i suppose this is a question about the physical benefits you've noticed from the gym that you think you wouldn't have got from a recreational sport also something about how you measure progress and discipline in the gym i think because there is something about the barbell in particular where you put the effort in you get the results out and you can track it numerically it's cold hard proof of progress that something like recreational soccer might not give. What are your thoughts on this, guys? Starting with you, Mike. Uh, I don't think it's a replacement for barbell training at all. Um, I think, of course, like you can enjoy all the health benefits from getting really good at a sport. For sure, I've been 
you know, I was athletic most of my life and, and gained a lot of health benefits from that. But there's something very different about lifting weights and the cold objectivity of weight on the bar. Like I, there's two and a half pounds that, you know, there's always two and a half more pounds you can lift. And that two and a half pounds can, can uh, I think, forges a different character quality than just being good at a sport, right? There's always going to be two and a half more pounds that's going to crush you or crush the next man. No man ever really masters this, right? Past a certain point, you're kind of, uh, you're working, you're working uphill, right? With, especially if you're not using performance enhancing drugs, which is an entirely different topic, but there's something about the cold objectivity of lifting weights, the numbers on the bar. Um, you know, everybody quotes Henry Rollins, like 200 pounds is always 200 pounds. There's something amazing about that, especially to a man. It's a, it's, it's a great, it's a great teacher, but also physical strength and cultivating physical strength does something to a man's spirit and his, and his mind, uh, the, the man that's paying attention can gain a lot of things about life. Certainly I've gained so much spiritually, mentally in developing my discipline and also in, in my businesses over the years, without that foundation of strength and knowing how to push up against resistance, you know, being uncomfortable in uncomfortable situations to get good, to achieve any level of strength requires one to be, to become comfortable in the uncomfortable. Will and you know, Rich, you guys know this very well. A lot of those sets are just, your mind wants to quit, right? But there's something about forging yourself through that, uh, that stimulus that's fundamentally different from being good at a sport. And that's what I believe. Yeah. The step-by-step -step progress and knowing that there's a little bit ahead of where you are that can humble you. And when you finally get there though, and for me, one of the big things is being able to handle for reps, a weight that in the past I couldn't dream of doing for one. And then you realize you're doing it casually. And you see, right, I had that potential, but I had to work to actually manifest it. And you know then what the fruits of your labor can be. And it reminds you of your potential in other areas of life as well. Business, for example. The problem that seems insurmountable, be patient, be consistent. And then that time and that effort will wear away at it. Rich, your thoughts on this. Gym versus sport. Why do you train rather than just go and have a pickup game of basketball or something? I say do both, but definitely make sure you do the weightlifting. That forges a, a different type of character. As, as you said, Mike, and I, I can't agree with more what, what you just said. And doing it also as well for, you don't need to do it for hours. Just get to the gym, go lift weights for 25 minutes. It'll make your, it'll make your quote unquote soccer game, whatever it is, even better. And if you think about professional athletes, they're all going to the gym anyways. They're all lifting weights on the side to supplement their training that they're doing like in soccer or baseball or football or whatever you want it to be. They're also lifting weights because resistance training, especially for men, is critically important. So you get the discipline of, of doing it. You'll be better at your sport and you'll have something that's going to be lifelong because you might not be playing soccer when you have, you know, your first kid, second kid, third kid, whatever it might be, but you can still get to the gym for 25 minutes and go lift heavy and lift hard and get and get right back out. And the benefits of being strong. Yeah, that's right. I think there's also something about iron and the feel of metal in the hand that is good for men. This might sound mystical and hippie-ish, but think about what weapons have meant to men over the centuries in the past and the young man with the broad sword or the axe or whatever it might be having an activity that connects you to metal heavy stuff hard stuff and combines that with discipline that's feeding like a genetic and spiritual need that men have that the soft modern world can't give them there's a great line in homer's poem the odyssey when Odysseus and his son Telemachus, they go to the armory and they're getting ready to clear out all the suitors who've been making a mess of his home while he's been away. And the line is that the iron of itself calls to men. So young guys who see the gym and think, I like the look of that. There's a reason for that. And it's got an appeal to men that's stronger than the appeal it has to women. Do you guys feel there's something like primal and ancestral about having something heavy in your hands? Absolutely. Yes. And I love that you mentioned that because it has been my thoughts for years. And, uh, 
uh, Will, something that you said, I think it was on Will Spencer's podcast, is that it reconnects a man with the toil of being a man, like the hard, the, the, the core value of hard labor, you know, where Adam was his whole reason for living. Part of it was to render resources from the earth and provision, right? And I think there's something so essential about that. And something I mentioned in my talk too was that, you know, we're a society of, of people that look at our bodies as just a means of transportation for our brains, right? And so we we're so disconnected from our hearts, our stomachs, and our bodies and what our muscles are capable of, right? So I absolutely agree. That's a perfect way to put it, Will. Rich, thoughts on this? Yeah, there's, I mean, I, I agree. And there's, there's something to be said about having the steel in your hands and, and getting calloused up and not wearing gloves and picking and just, you know, picking, picking up the heavy weight and lifting it. And like also, and also knowing in the back of your mind, if anything went wrong, you can go carry your family out of a, a terrible situation. I mean, just carry your wife. I mean, carry, you could probably carry all of them at the same time. <laughs> And I know I could. <laughs> I've tested myself. I could do it. <laughs> that makes me laugh. My kids I, are still small, but yeah, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, when I uh, I separated my shoulder in an accident, falling off my bike, the clavicle is still off the bone, off the ligaments, and uh, to rehab it, I just started doing really gentle press up from my knees, then not off the knees. Then I put one baby on my back, then another baby, and then added a toddler. And just kept stacking kids up until I could do all the kids and then got back in the gym after that and used the bar. So I've got some funny pictures of my rehab progression with just more and more piles of children on my back doing push ups. <laughs> we got a question That's about awesome. uh, doing reps for the rosary. Um, so Will has influenced me to do reps for Christ, rosary reps. So this is about uh, discipline in prayer. I find being consistent for nine to 12 weeks, then taking one week off is a beneficial formula of fasting from the weights and repeating. Okay, so we've got two things there. One, you get your work in with prayer, just like you do in the gym. And this is more of a gym programming question, to be honest. When do you guys take time off? How do you know when you need it? So I can jump in here. So, so I'll I think program. No, go ahead, Rich. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say no, no time off. I don't think there should ever, ever be a, a time off. I mean, you can, if you need time off, maybe you got injured. That's fair enough. You could still do something else, but there should be, I, I truly believe after all these years, you never, you never let up. I mean, even, you know, Easter's going to come up and I'll, I'll feast and enjoy Easter. But other than that, there's, there is no, there's no let off. There's always, there's always a day for prayer. There's always a day for um, lifting. There's every, you have to do it every single day. And St. Benedict calls for, in the rule of St. Benedict, a continuous Lent. And that's, that's pretty intense. But if you transfer it over to, to our times and our life, you need a you need a continuous Lent too. You always need that that pushing, that self denial, um, just to, to keep going through. And and even if you're going through the motions and you're tired, I think you still have to go through and not allow yourself any let up outside of an injury on prayer and and lifting. You don't yeah. you don't stop parenting for you know for a week. You don't stop praying for a week. You just keep going. What, what I'll tend to do is at times when I'm feeling beat down in the gym or really stressed from combination of just total life stress, rather than stop exercising completely, I'll just do something really light and easy. I'll just at least walk into the gym and maybe do a couple of bicep curls or a couple of chin ups and fart around on the exercise bike for a bit. And then I've done something just to keep the momentum, but I won't push myself hard. I'll give myself an easy week. And then once the fires are stoked again, I'll get back at it properly. But in terms of like a whole weeks off or like two weeks off, I very rarely do that. I'll try and keep the habits there, but ease off the gas. What do you think, Mike? Uh, okay, so for prayer, uh, non-negotiable. You pray every morning, every night, midday, never a day off. I just don't see a point in ever stopping that. I mean, way to, you know give yourself a spiritual blind spot that the enemy can sneak into. But as far as training, I've had some run-ins when where the gym has forced me to take time off. 
Um, I don't think a lot of guys are in that camp where they, they train so relentless. This is not meant to be self-aggrandizing. Well, you can probably relate to this. I, I love to train and I love to train hard. So the times where I've had to take a break is because my body's forced me to, whether it's like legitimate overtraining or libido, desire to train, you know, nagging injuries, strength going backwards. Those are times where, but even in then, even in those instances, I still train. Just like Will said, I dial back the percentage a little bit, but I think People are doing themselves a disservice in their training by taking planned weeks off. What if you're making progress up until that week off? What is the point in letting up? There's no point. Actually, a strategy that I like, because I like to, to lift with a lot of weight, when I come to a point where I'm feeling a little bit beat up, I tend to, and this is, this is scientific as well, volume contributes more to central and peripheral fatigue than intensity, meaning weight on the bar. Right. So what I do is I drop all the accessory bodybuilding stuff, all the volume, meaning, you know, sets to 10, 12, 15. I take my belt off so it keeps the load down on my spine and I just lift one to five reps, but still heavy, still conditioning my nervous system to be under those weights. So when I come back to training the subsequent week, I don't feel like those weights crush me. Like I don't that 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 sense of heaviness isn't there. I'm still conditioned to just continue without missing a beat on my training program. So I don't. I don't see a point in taking an actual week off unless you're actually legitimately ill or have an injury. There should always be a work around because what I find too is even with injuries, the thing that injured you is often the thing that helps you rehab the quickest. I've partially torn my pec more times than I can count. What helps rehab that the most? Light bench pressing, getting blood flow. That you know, I think things start to go sideways and you start to tighten up when you stop moving. So I don't think there's a really a time or place other than illness or injury for a week off. Yeah, I found that with a, a bad back injury from deadlifting and the advice from doctors about, well, you must never deadlift. All it does is it makes you more afraid, more anxious. Your brain wants to limit that range of motion more. So get back into the thing that scares you and just start light, start easy, work back into it, build confidence. And this is about anxiety in life generally as well. Don't avoid the thing that makes you feel anxious and afraid. You have to confront it, face it down. And then once you've done that, you'll be able to grow through it. So again, life lessons in the gym there too. Uh, next question is, I seem to be a hard gainer. Any practical tips or good exercises routines for getting stronger for someone who is short and skinny? 5'9", 140 pounds. I have a bar and squat rack and can train four days a week. Rich, any thoughts on this? He wants to gain weight and he wants to make progress, but he thinks he can't. How, I mean, how, it'd be nice to know like age. Cause I mean, as a, as a man, you're only going to accelerate and be able to get stronger and put on more weight as you, as you age. Um, I don't know, just eat, eat right, eat the right amount of protein. Don't make a God out of it and, and keep, and keep lifting, lift, lift heavy. And, and that's it. Mike. So there. when I hear this term, hard, this, this, when I hear this term hard gainer, maybe it's because I'm a jaded coach that I've been doing this for so long. Uh, I just, I hate hearing that stuff. It's like a fat person saying, well, I can't lose weight. It's because you eat too much. And to the hard gainer, well, it's because you don't eat enough, right? First of all, are you tracking your macros and calories? That's a, that's a logical place to start. But number two, what I find with these hard gainer types, and I'm not trying to come down in this, in this, this, this person too, too hard here, is that they say that they eat a lot. But typically they do not. What I notice always with these people is that they, they don't eat much during the day. They'll eat light maybe at lunch and then stuff a whole bunch of calories in the evening. You can't play catch up if you're actually trying to be in a caloric surplus. Start the day early with calories. Eat calorically dense foods, fat or, or foods that are higher in fat because, you know, uh, carbohydrates and protein are four calories a gram. Fat is nine. So dress your stuff in a little more olive oil, you know, eat some avocado eat pasta, eat stuff that don't eat generally super, super healthy because those foods are going to be uh, very high in, in satiety. They're going to keep you full. So don't be afraid. So if you're trying to lose weight, err on the side of 90, 90% healthy, clean food, quote unquote, 10%, you know, whatever you want. And then with somebody that's trying to gain weight, that has a hard gainer, you do need to opt for more calorically dense foods, but making sure that you get in those calories earlier on in the day. So you're not playing catch up later on. It is a slog. I had to eat my way up to 300 pounds, even though my metabolism is that of like a fat guy, I gain weight very, very easily. It doesn't take me a whole lot. I can just eat and eat. There's no off switch. Um, there was an element of having to force it down. So also too, if you're not somebody that has a huge appetite, uh, li liquid calories and shakes are going to be your friend as well. Uh, just make sure you're, you know, you're not eating in an insane surplus. 
I think it's it's very very important to mitigate fat gain when you're trying to gain weight. So I would I think it would behoove any person at least for a three month span throughout their lifting career to at least track and weigh their food for three months just to kind of properly quantify what they're eating so they get an actual understanding of portion sizes and what and what have you. So I think it's just a process of self education as well. It's something that I've done even eleven years later. I still weigh and track all my food just because I'm a little OCD like that. Um, but I think that's important. Don't play catch up with your calories. Uh, uh, keep your repetition range between six and 10 excessively high reps are unnecessarily fatiguing reps below sets below five or six. They're really just expressions of strength and neural adaptation. And, and yeah, don't play catch up with your calories. Liquid calories are also your friend. Yeah. Really good tips. And the scales as well. If you're trying to gain weight, weigh yourself regularly. And that is your ultimate feedback on whether you're eating enough to, in fact, gain weight. You might feel like you're really full and you're eating loads, but your body's telling you, no, you still need more. And like Mike's saying, spread it out over the day. And we want something manageable that you can stick to consistently for a long time. Because if you just bolt your way up to something a bit heavier, like 160, 170, 180, but then you're sick of doing that and you go back to your eating habits, mm -hmm. guess what? You're going to lose the weight again. So you need to be able to stick to it for years, which means it should be a little bit of effort and push you a little bit. And you might have some meals where you feel uncomfortable, but you can keep it going for 10 years. And that's what Mike was saying. After about 10 years, you'll get a good idea of what your genetic potential is. Too many guys think they want results after six months. Like you don't know yet how you're going to turn out after 10 years of effort. So play the long game. He's only 18, guys. He's only 18. So... I think a lot of it is just eating like an adult Sorry. rather than a, a kid, I think. Yep. All right. Yep. Next question. Any good spiritual routines to help balance out physical ones? Good question. Spiritual routine. So what do you guys like to do over the course of a typical week then? So mm -hmm. I'll, uh, when I first wake up in the morning, before I get out of bed, I'll say a prayer. And then I'll pray the Psalms over the week. And then I'll either get them all in and be really happy with myself or I won't quite make it. And I'll just restart again the next week rather than trying to get bogged down and trying to catch up. So prayer in the morning, Psalms over the week, and then evening prayer as well. I say the rosary with the kids. What kind of things do you have as part of your prayer discipline, Rich? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I think a, an important one to set the stage for a lot of guys. So my prayer routine, I wake up 5.30 every morning. I put my coffee on in, in a percolator. So it takes a, takes a few minutes when you do it that way. I go, I say, uh, I say the Our Father, the Amata Christi, St. Michael. I pray for my family for uh, spiritual protection. You know, by the time my coffee's brewed, I'm sitting down and reading the Bible for uh, at least like 20 minutes about. I'm reading approximately three and a half to four pages, sometimes five, six, if it's if it's flowing well, um, every single morning. So five days a week I'm doing this. Then on Saturdays, I'm reading um, the readings for Sunday. Um, I'm usually picking up a, a sermon that's going to reflect what the readings are for Sunday. So I grab, I have all the sermons of the year from St. Alphonse de Gori. I'm just going through those sermons. I also have um, St. John Christendom's um, Gospels According to John, where he wrote all his homilies there. And then uh, I, have one, I have one other one that I'm not thinking of. You can also look on Census Fidelium, and they'll have the sermons that are upcoming um, on there or, or even after the fact. And that after that, I, I typically do some, some education for myself. I go for a quick walk and my kids are start to get going after that. And then that's, that ends the prayer of the morning. Then during the day, I, I often pray during the day and then I close it out at night with a set of prayers. And that's, that's what I've essentially been doing for years and years and years and years and years, a long time. I've been reading the Bible straight and I've, you know, cover to cover for, it's been over three and a half years now um that i've been doing that discipline so i think you know that helps that helps me balance it out and again like hey we're, we'll say going through the motions it does go through the motions a bit on some of those mornings 
Um, but you, you put in the work anyway and you do it regardless of the fact, like that's, that's your job. And also you're praying for your family and, and the protection of your family as well. Yeah. Really good advice there. I love the fact that the Bible reading is a little bit every day, but it all adds up over time. Just like going to the gym too. Everyone can set a target of reading the Bible 15 minutes a day. You keep that up for a couple of years. You'll be surprised what you accomplish and how much you know. Mike, how about you? So I guess there was a time in your life where you weren't praying at all. Is that right? And then now it's a big part of your life. What have you noticed in including that? Yeah, so I was raised Roman Catholic. I it was an atheist for five or six years. I consumed all the Dawkins, Hitchens, Harris content that you know typical atheists would go through. And you know, I I would say that I came back to the faith in, in 2015 as a Christian and then baptized recently in October of 2022. Um, there's less chaos in my life. There's more contentment. There's more uh, street streamlined thought process. I could say I'm less scattered. Um, I could, I'm able to be more present with my family and, and actually enjoy the fruits of my labor. I was, I'm, I'm a, I'm a man that still, it, it, I struggle at times where I'm always thinking ahead, you know, it's a type a business mindset that I have, but, in that prayer and in that spiritual journey, it's grounded me in such a significant way. It's taught me patience, especially with my wife, because although I called myself a Christian for a lot of our marriage, I wasn't leading her like, you know, cry or lo loving her like Christ loved the church. I was quick to anger, slow to forgive. I was very much a tyrant in many ways. And the most profound aspect of me getting baptized was, was the, the confrontation with my own sin, unlike I've ever been confronted with before. It was quite powerful. And so uh, I urge everybody to get into a, a deep spiritual routine that keeps my day. I, I call it like the perfect container for the day. I start my day much like you, Rich. I get my coffee brewing. I go downstairs before I start any work at all, anywhere. So there's a prayer in my head as soon as I open my eyes. And when I before I start work, I, I like to work through this book. You know, I'm working through it again. It's New Morning Mercies by Paul David Tripp. And it's just a page of a devotional with an accompanying, accompanying uh, um chapter in the Bible and some verses. So I'm always reading the word every morning before I get in to any type of work. So that, that'll take me, you know, 15 or 20 minutes. I pray for my family. I pray for the day. I pray to just, and the most profound prayer, if I just want to share, I just want to share this with you guys is I've been struggling a little bit lately. This, this, this demon of discontentment has kind of um, reemerged in my life, like always wanting more and striving for more, whether it be the gym or in this case, financially, I've really just been praying to God in the way and that, and that is, God, I just I just trust you with every aspect of my life. I'm a very anxious person. I'm not going to be anxious about tomorrow, about the next move. Just give me the wisdom to accomplish what I need to accomplish today as a man, because today is the only day that's promised. My death has already been written. I give all of my anxiety to you, because I think anxiety comes from a place of not trusting God and his plan for your life. And so in, in doing that, my goodness, man, like the ability to be present with my family and enjoy and the contentment that's uh, reemerged in my life has been profound. And I also think, too, it, it's very important that, that men and women alike pay attention to what they're consuming as far as content on their Instagrams or Twitter, on, on podcasts and music. Since switching to exclusively to Christian music and exclusively to Christian podcasts, it's just more, it's further reinforced that point. If you're listening to Phil's secular music, a lot of these secular podcasts talking about, you know, what have you, uh, I find, at least for myself, my life kind of descends into some mental and spiritual chaos. When everything is centered around the word, there's there's a peace that I that is indescribable. And, and so, and for most men too, and this is where I started, start in the wisdom texts, Ecclesiastes, Job, uh, Proverbs. I think there's some powerful lessons in there, uh, particularly for like the modern man that that finds himself entrenched in hustle and grind set culture so yeah huge really for important me. advice about staying present <clears throat> and living day by day that is one of the big tricks that the devil uses to try and get us into a place of despair and anxiety but we're told in scripture that sufficient to the day is the evil thereof and again it's like doing a hard set rep by rep whatever difficult time you're going through, all you can deal with is what's right there in front of you. And if you keep getting the reps right, getting the days right, the weeks will be right, the months will be right, the years will be right. So you can't think about the stuff you can't control. You can only control what's here right in front of you, and then it will be as good as it can be. If you make the process right, 
how can the product end up bad? I've nearly died enough times in my life to know that tomorrow could be the day. You don't know. Maybe it'll be a bad driver or some freak mm. accident. So you've got to deal with today. That's the most important thing and cherish a time with your family. We have a question here, which was a good one about vanity. I find myself admiring my hair in the mirror as I've recently grown it out. Rich, are you getting longing feelings about the hair? <laughs> Thinking of shaving it off, but unsure if this is a long-term solution. Any advice? Well, I, my quick stab at this would be, you couldn't think your hair looks nice as long as you thank God for it. What do you think, Rich? Shave yeah, it off. Yeah. You, that's a, I think that's a, that's a valid point. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think it's a valid point. I mean, even if you shave it off, who cares? Hair grows back, so that's that's one thing, right? It'll grow, it'll grow back. Um, I don't. Maybe it's maybe it's a thing for you, like you know, guys with six packs and stuff. Like maybe it's maybe your hair is a thing. I don't know. Yeah, that's yeah. a that's a who knows. I, I it's a funny question. I hair. I love this question though. Well, it grows about, back, like, so do what you do. Yeah, but it, it needn't be the hair, right? Though. It might be like Mike thinking like, oh, yeah, look at my video of myself deadlifting 800 pounds, in which case it's his strength. It, men have got good things about them that can make them feel puffed up with pride. Yeah. And the solution to Mike wouldn't be uh, deliberately trash your performance so you can't lift as much. It is instead be grateful that you've got this gift on loan. Well said, Will. Yeah. Well said. You know, it's funny. I, I, I had a direct confrontation with this thing, maybe not with the hair, even though I do sometimes admire my hair, but it's all, <laughs> it's always going to come back. It's always got to come back to, to, to gratitude to the father. And what I mean was there was a couple of months ago where I, I missed a set. I was, you know, I can't remember what it was, but I wanted six reps and I got five and there was no way I could have gotten six on that day. And most of the time I'd be despondent because I was looking forward to that lift for the day to make myself feel whole. And which, as we know, is no such thing. And so when I failed that, I knew I was growing in my, my spiritual journey and my walk with God because I sat down after and I said, I said, thank you, God, for even just giving me the ability to show up here and lift this kind of weight. Who cares if I didn't miss or if I missed that rep? I'm just grateful to be here. Two arms, two legs, breathing, at least a half functioning brain and able to do what I, I can do with my body, which I can say, you know, and, and again, all glory to the father that not a lot of men have, have lifted this kind of weight before. So I should be grateful that on any given day I can perform uh, in, in this way. So as long as you're bringing the gratitude back to the father, it's like me looking at my wife and saying, my God, she's gorgeous, which she is. But praises be to the father for, for blessing me with her. And so I think that grounds us all. Yeah. Excellent point. Gratitude. Cultivate it as much as you can. Uh, I think Cicero, non-Christian, but he still saw the truth, had a remark about it being the, uh, the parent of the other virtues. So if you're truly grateful, then it's only going to lead to flourishing in all areas of your spiritual life. Good question. Funny side to it, but also a really deep, important side to it as well. All right. Another question. Someone's been watching the Sea Mask podcast and says it's already pay paying off. Got married in February and learned she's expecting today. Congratulations. Very happy to hear that. Any recommendations or sources for expecting fathers? So many mainstream things are cringe, anti traditional, anti male, anti Christian. Of course, when they say smash patriarchy, what they really mean is smash Christianity because Christianity is patriarchy. And the attack on the fathers with a small f is ultimately rooted in a diabolic attack on the father with a capital F. And look, guys, let's be honest. That's why it's been done so masterfully for a couple of hundred years now, because this isn't really a merely human assault. There's a diabolic superintelligence behind this, and we wrestle against an immortal enemy. It's not just a couple of people with blue hair and stupid pronouns. It's a lot bigger than that. So, Mike, you're a father. Rich, you're a father too. What did you find about preparing for fatherhood? What wasn't helpful? What was helpful? Any books or resources that you felt made a difference? Mike. 
Well, uh, so no books or resources come to mind other than the Bible and loving your, your wife like, you know, like, you know, Christ loved the church. That's first and foremost, because uh, I failed at that. And what I can say is right off the top of my head, I, I can tell you what not to do. And this is something that I did from my direct experience was don't just hang your hat on the provider role. Don't just hang your hat on being the protector. That's what happened with me. As soon as my wife got pregnant, we found out, okay, bought a place, bought a vehicle. You know, unfortunately, you know, we got, um, she got pregnant out of wedlock, got married, did the things, ticked the boxes. And then that's where it ended for me. I wasn't there for her in the way that I should have been. I didn't lead her in the way that, that, that I should have, having, you know, more tenderness, more patience, understanding that there was this extremely, man, it, I'm faced, I, that was one of the most foremost examples of the glory of God and knowing how many things have to go correctly for a viable baby to come to term. Like, talk about a miraculous process. And what ha happens to a woman is, is indescribable. I mean, as a man, I was just looking at it, you know, from the outside, is just, I know, do not hang your hat on those things. You might be, you know, doing them already just because you're financially taking care of her, you're protecting her, you're doing all of these things. That's not where your role ends. It's it's merely the cost to entry for a man. Lead her in every way, especially in the spiritual sense, and, and love on her like, like Christ loved the church. Have patience and then have more patience because what her body's going through is, is indescribable. I do agree, though, that most of the resources, resources out there are completely cringe and, quite frankly, cucked. So I don't know. I wouldn't know where to point you. I just the, the way the way that I learned was by making a lot of mistakes. Yep. Super important advice there. Too many guys now, especially getting very into some of the the secular but traditional advice about fatherhood available on social media, saying you need to provide, fixate on that. And like Mike says, it's just a starting point. And you can actually be a terrible husband with a huge income. You can be a billionaire and a bad husband. Yep. And no one cares if you can take her to the Seychelles or the Maldives every year and you buy a Ferrari to drive around them because you can be a really neglectful husband despite all of that. Rich, what have you found? Um, yeah, I I didn't read anything, you know, kind of going into it. Uh, so that's... Again, I think that's a that's also a big benefit of staying offline and not reading those that silly stuff that's online and also helping your wife, you know, do that as well. And it's going to be a lot harder for her to like not, you know, get on the scroll and start looking articles online like what what should a mother do? Like what to do in this instance? What to do here? I think natural instinct takes over a lot of times and you just, you know, you take upon your role um, and let her take upon her role also um parents right so your your parents are going to be some of your best advice that you can get on it like hopefully you know you have pretty good and like maybe if you you didn't have the best ones in in your point of view um they probably still know a thing or two and you have you have parents on both sides right that can assist with advice on that other men that are in similar situations that have young kids so you meet those guys at church you know, link up with them and what, you could always ask them questions. Hopefully she has a friend that has young children as well to ask questions. Um, you have a, a solid, a solid friend for your wife, I think would be, would be beneficial. A solid friend for you would be beneficial. And then um, staying off your phone, not, not reading the, uh, the articles and then growth too, right? Your children, once, once you have a baby and you're responsible in that manner, I, in, in my mind, that's when you, you can step into manhood fully because you take on that, you take on the husband role and then you take on the father role. And that, that gives you, it gives you so many graces and then it provides patience for you. You end up being more patient with your wife. I mean, you could be quick to temper and you make mistakes. And I made a lot of mistakes too, where I was quick to anger or, um, especially with my wife during those early times between lack of sleep, but then you, you, as long your prayer life solid, your lifting life is solid. Um, you can make those corrections as you move along and, and you'll see those faults and your, your children will start to, to forge you because it puts, um, it puts your, any self idolatry that you thought you had is all gone very quickly. And if it's not, I mean, you got bigger problems. Yeah. It's a good rite of passage, perhaps the only true one. 
becoming a father and it makes you very aware of your own flaws and being confronted by them is a good stimulus for spiritual growth great advice for both of, from both of you there for toxic 373 hopefully he's not going to be so toxic after hearing those words of wisdom <laughs> and we have got the last question for this evening so this is a really interesting one guys think back to when you were 18 19 so john says i'm 19 and live with my single mother and younger sister who's 18. there's absolutely no structure in the house and i cannot help but feel emasculated letting this slide part two of the question he says no matter how much i try to ignore it am i wrong for moving out and seeking adventure and independence in my own life so he's 19 feeling like home life isn't going well with a single mum and a sister one year younger than him what do you think he should be doing staying and trying to bring a bit more order to the household or leave strike out on his own mike let's start with you as much as the the italian boy in me says stick around and try to provide structure to the household i'm not sure if that's possible even with the best of mothers i think it's just <clears throat> antithetical to a mother's nature to to allow her son to take on the patriarchal role i don't think it's the way god had intended it either and this is i my mother is incredible she's an angel but what i knew early on is i had to move out and detach myself from her i ended up living with my grandfather for the majority of my life until i, I moved out and i'm living with my wife so i think you know it's normal to feel that gut impulse but i think he's doing the right thing for his own manhood is that an essential part of manhood and this is what's so lost among young men is the initiation into manhood so you become sort of like this adult, this adult male that's still a boy, this prolonged period of adolescence where it is a fundamental, uh, it's fundamental of you to move out, cut the umbilical cord, because unfortunately a byproduct of living with your mom that long is that it emasculates you. Whether you want to acknowledge it or not, it will emasculate you and it, it will, you'll just fail to launch, man. And I think, I think he's got the right, a bright idea, but I understand the battle because I was once there as well. And just by the way, guys, are we, we're staying on for uh, a little bit longer. I just got to run and grab my charger. This is eating into my battery a bit. Yeah, yeah, a bit yeah. More than I thought. Like, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, yeah. Cool. Thanks, guys. The, um, uh, the point Mike just made there about how you aren't the boss of your mom is really crucial. You don't have authority over your mother. She has authority over you. So that's always going to put you in the exact position Mike outlined there, whereby you are submissive to your mother. And... It's a part of every developing boy's life, young man's life, that you have to go and forge by yourself into the world. And you're going to have a wife that you have authority over with great responsibility for her as well. And that's a completely different setup. And at your age, that's what you are being told by your instincts, your God-given instincts, that that's what you need. Rich, what do you think about this one? I, I, I think that's a that's a tough one. I mean, here's here's the thing. You will learn a lot about yourself by by moving out, especially if you have the right disciplines and, and everything in in place. Um, so regardless, even if you end up returning back for whatever reason, you're going to re return back almost in a in a in a different way. You're going to be returning back more as a man who has gone out and struck it on his own. Um, and I can't remember, uh, so Telemachus, right, in Homer. So he has to go out, he has to leave his father's household um, to go on a journey, even though he ends up right back at the same exact place. And, you know, from that, <clears throat> from that poem, he goes out and he meets basically the kings that his father served with and in in doing so he learned number one the honor of his father and he was bestowed those honors as well and learned lessons along the way then made the voyage back to only link up with his father to you know rain hell down upon the suitors that were eating up the house so i think as a man even if you are in your you know quote unquote father's household and he's absentee and just your mother there quote is penelope is is there you need to still go out and strike and strike it out on your own, even if you do end up returning, um, because you're going to learn a lot of lessons on the way. And you might even learn, um, 
you know, as, as he did, like who your father is on the way of, of going out and getting and getting out and then returning um, in, a, in a different mindset. Yeah, that's important. It's, a, it's an important thing for you to do to go and seek that adventure and let it change you because the responsibility is a thing that you're currently lacking as well as the authority. So you're going to discover who you are when you move out and then have a deeper appreciation for your father's successes or as it may be failings as well. And that will all change you as a man. All right, we've got Mike back now. So let's get uh, another question. And Benjamin says, oh, great question. Great question. <laughs> Benjamin says, I'm finding the deeper I get into Christianity, the less I have in common with my friends. And I don't particularly wish to see them. Should I tell them directly? Or just gradually stop seeing them. Well, in his commentary on Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, Aquinas says that we must prefer truth to friends. So if you're telling a friend the truth and that's what ends your friendship, then you've been a true friend to him for telling him that his behavior is bad for him, for example or refusing to be complicit in a lie, or to partake in sinful activities with him. If you had let him go ahead in that, you're encouraging behavior that's bad for him, and you are also doing something bad for yourself as well. So there do come breaking points in friendships, and that can lead to a bit of heartbreak as well, if it's an old friend, and these are activities that you bonded over in the past. What have you found with this, Mike? Have you found that as you've gone deeper into Christianity, some of the pastimes you had before or some of the friendship circles have drifted out of your life? Or were there just big points where you said, that's it, I'm not talking to you? It, 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 for me, it was the former. Uh, it, people kind of naturally drifted away from me because uh, the, the activities that I used to partake in were no longer uh, due to my faith and especially due to you know becoming a husband and a father. Uh, but especially when the content of a lot of the, you know, I try to surround myself with mainly Christian men now, Christian men and women. Well, I'm not friends with women because I think men and women that are married shouldn't be friends with one another. But that's a that's a conversation for a different day. Uh, but it, it certainly has happened naturally. And I don't think a man that's it, it's certainly hard. I think your flesh is going to is going to feel upset. It's going to feel discontent for a while. But no, that's a purification process of your social circle. I think every man, I think periodically, has got to take a real audit of the social circle and really, you know, try to look at it objectively. Is the social circle serving me in any way? Are we just guys that go out to the to the bar and get drunk and, and talk to women? How is this serving? How is this serving me? Because a, a friend that's not willing to tell you the truth is not a friend at all. And if you're not willing to tell the truth to a friend, then you know you're not as good of a friend as maybe you think you are either. So I think those conversations are certainly worth having. And because what I have found is that in my bold proclamation of faith, no matter even if my friends, some of my friends aren't of the faith, some of them have come around as a result of you know me growing in my faith. So I think there's something very powerful there. The ones that want to listen will stick around. The ones that don't, that want to continue and stay in the same place and stay complacent, will do so. And let life, let God weed those people out for you. Don't stay attached to it to them. Um, but for me, it certainly has happened naturally. So. Yeah, you're not a true friend unless you are telling them the hard truth they need to hear to improve. And what you'll find, actually, I found anyway, is that some of the people you think might want to disown you, if they're smart guys who've got good discernment, even though what you have to say might hurt them, they'll be curious and they want to know more about it. So I've got non-Christian friends saying, uh, it's, let's say I did want to start reading the Bible. Like, where, where should I start, Will? Um, and that's a good thing. It's a good thing to have introduced into their lives, even if out of opposition initially. Rich, how about you? Yeah, I would I would say those folks will fall off by themselves, right? So you just keep living how you're going to live, and they'll naturally uh, attrition out. And that that I found that that happened to me quite a bit, where it was just a natural attrition. The hobby that kept you together, which was you know, drinking and womanizing. Once you're not drinking or womanizing, or you're not doing it in, in an excess, they will naturally fall away because that was the glue that held you together in the first place. 
And then you'll see, you'll start finding other friends and those will drift in from unexpected places um, that share the same interests as you do and are on the same um, trajectory in some way or another. And those, those friendships will form deeper. And I mean, guys are only meant, uh, in, in my personal opinion, and I think the data probably proves this out, but in kind of bro knowledge, guys only are going to have one or two good friends, period, anyway. And, the, and those are the friends that will tell you the truth. And uh, I just have a, a quick a quick story about that. A friend, and I mean, we just stay in touch here and there, but it's it's an important thing. Uh, when I was when I was going to get married, I, was, I, I originally got married outside the church. And, you know, you could always tell a good friend because he called me and I invited him to my, my quote unquote wedding outside the church. Um, and he said, hey, man, what are you doing? And we had a very uncomfortable conversation that evening. But um, that's that's the that's a test of a of a real friend that can come and tell you the truth and call you out on, on what's going on and, and kind of bring light to your eyes like um, like the scales falling away from your eyes. Like you you want those folks around you. The other ones are, will go by by the wayside on their own accord just because you're doing something else. And then lastly, I'll add is um, you might be an influence on them too. So here's, here's the thing. The more they try to persuade you and don't break you from bending um, your uh, deeper relationship into Christianity, into the church, whatever it may be, the more they try to do that and not break you, you become an example to them, whether you remain friends or not. You'll be an example and they might look back in 10 years and be like, hey, this guy, you know, kind of knew what he was doing five, 10 years ago. Um, and, and you'll be used as an example for that person's conversion. So live steadfast and um, you know, opt out of that mess and they'll fall away by themselves. You'll find new, new one or two at the end of the day that can tell you the truth and you should be the same for somebody else, too. Yep. Perfect advice, Rich. Well done. Do it in a in a way that isn't um, aggressively confrontational, Benjamin. Uh, St. Francis de Sales says that you're going to catch more flies with honey than with vinegar. So you don't want to just make a point out of trying to fall out with them. Show that it's coming from a place of love and give your reasons for it. You need to try and appeal to their intellects and then they will appreciate that. And... Look, if the truth hurts them, and this is like a, a the vampire running away from sunlight deal, then they're going to know deep down that the fault is with them rather than with you and you did the right thing. And Rich is saying there that who knows, years down the line, that might be the greatest uh, teaching for them. Right, we're going to wrap this up, guys. We've been going for about an hour and a quarter now. Good questions. And you can find both of these gentlemen on twitter and mike's on instagram as well i'll put the links to their accounts into the video description guys any final thoughts for people about projects that you're up to and where they can see more of your content mike so yeah you can find me on uh, instagram my name mike pantila and same thing on twitter uh i've been a lifelong fitness entrepreneur, but I've stepped into the men's coaching space and helping guys not only with their, their fitness, but with their, their faith walks, uh, a lot of them with their finances and just cultivating, you know, their own manhood, how to do that, you know, how to fix the mess in their lives, reconcile with their fathers and courtship. So, you know, if you're interested in that, give me a holler. Otherwise, I'm posting a lot of stuff on faith, uh, masculinity and marriage. And so I think um, I think after this this conversation, certainly after that conference on Saturday, I think there, there's been a call in my heart to start a podcast, the Virtue Pill podcast. So you're hearing it here first. So stay tuned for that in uh, the upcoming weeks. I appreciate you having me on, Will. I know we had a little bit of a timing kerfuffle with the, the UK time changing Saturday <laughs> night, and that's what I was basing this off of. Otherwise, I'd be in my office right now. So I apologize to the viewers. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's worked out well. Thanks for joining us. Really appreciate it. Rich, where can appreciate people you, find man. you? You're on, you're on Twitter under Rigid Discipline, right? Yep. Yeah, that's it. I mean, you can find me there. I think I'll, I'll post up a couple of blog articles. I'm not a good writer. Um, I just want to see men be more manly and kind of assume their role properly. Um, I got two young daughters, so I feel like anything I can do on my end 
to help guys kind of man up, so to speak, um, the better it will be. So you can find me on, yeah, Rigid, Rigid Discipline on Twitter. Um, and hey, count me in on your uh, your new upcoming podcast, Mike. I'd like to uh, participate Absolutely. in that one. That, that sounds pretty cool. And I'm just... And I'm just doing some uh, some blog posts. I'm not a, as I said, I'm not a, I'm not a good writer. I just got bro knowledge um, because I lived, you know, like you did, uh, Mike, degenerately for a long time. So you gain a level of experience <laughs> in diagnosing um, degeneracy in uh, in folks and and yourself. And uh, that's that's what that's what I care about. Just diagnosing and uh, ho- hopefully correcting and then rebuilding from the ground up, uh, our Christian culture. Yeah. To be honest, the, the more you make progress in the spiritual life, the more you are aware of your own degeneracy. If you read what the saints talk about, it's that they are, if anything, even more aware of their own failings than the crack addict who thinks that he's not doing anything wrong. So being sensitive to degeneracy isn't something that you just leave in the past and forget about it. You're like, attunement to it gets ever greater and that's why it's great for guys to be able to talk to people like you two because you can see things about them that they might not be able to see for themselves which is why the men's coaching role is a really important one and so many guys are looking for that kind of advice so i'll put the links to your socials in the video description people can hear more from you on your own accounts but it's been a real pleasure to talk to you both and then i'd like to do it again sometime Let's do it, Will. I, it was an honor, man. I really appreciate Sounds it. And uh, Rich, it was great uh, getting to chat with you as well. All right, guys. Take care. Yep, sounds good. Thanks a lot, guys. Bye. See you guys.